Okay, I know everybody has so much to say. That, that is one of the most special things about this group is how sociable you all are. But we would yeah. like we would like to uh, welcome our presenter today. Um, uh, and before I do, I have one more announcement from our uh, uh, vice president to be Bernadette, who says she needs one more sign up for refreshments for the September meeting. So if you can sign up for that, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Oh, don't sign up to me. I don't know. Oh, it's Bernadette. Um, okay. So, our speaker today is known to many of us. Our, our speaker today is known to many of us for her fantastic book, Golden Gate Gardening, um, which first came out in. 1993, the first edition, which I have, and um, since then I mean, we've added to sure. it quite a bit. So lots of new information in this new edition, the 30th, 30th edition. Well, no, Pam grew up in the Midwest in Indiana, and when she moved to San Francisco, had to learn all about mild winters and a year-round oh, garden, no. how you can have gardening all year long, uh, as we all know. I don't know what and the climate of the Bay Area and the plants that can be grown here were all things that she learned and studied no. by uh, gardening in other people's backyards and in containers and then in the community garden. Okay. And in the early 80s, she participated in the founding of the Slug, San Francisco League of that's Urban that's Gardeners. <laughs> that oh, is an organization still going that supported both community and home gardeners citywide. She also taught horticulture at City College of San Francisco for 30 years. She's uh, written articles for magazines on nutrition, food history, food politics, food preparation, and um, this is has another book besides the one that we have here called yeah. Wildly yeah. Successful Plants. Right. Isn't that a title that you can go for? Yes. Um, and for Northern California specifically. And she introduces 50 heirloom garden plants um, in that book. And it is illustrated with photos by her husband, David, a wonderful photographer. <laughs> and um, as you all know, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have, as as we said, year-round gardening. But all these little microclimates, you know, uh, Contra Costa County is different from San Francisco, from Noe Valley, the Mission. Each little area has its own thing. And I think Pam is a renowned expert in that. It, it's amazing to think of the research and the experimentation that she must have done over the years to become such an expert. I'm sharing the screen. So, got are, we, are we almost good? Yes. Um, before Pam oh, starts, I'm sorry, David. Come before on. Pam starts, the lecture will be accompanied by two handouts. Pam will be saying, refer to my handout. I can put it on. And if you don't have them, they're sitting at the corner of the table. I put a few on some of the tables, but they're right here. Oh. Um, so with no further ado, I don't think, um, please welcome Pam Peters. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you, I think you'll have to find a used copy of Wild and Successful Plants right now. I recommend Biblio.com. Oh, do you have this on? Yes. Now, now you can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Biblio.com. B I B I L I O. Biblio.com. I recommend for used books. Much better than Amazon if you're not helping Amazon. You got it Right. So we'll hear Trying to turn it up. Can you hear me? Okay. You have a nice loud voice. Yeah, I do. 
I learned projection <laughs> since I was, you know, I was a uh, drama student. Anyway, um, so I recommend biblio.com to look for wildly successful plants, and about half of the plants in my garden are, are from that. Um, the, the native plant people have kind of done a bad job on it because on Amazon they gave us some negative reviews, and that was unfortunate. Um, I'm not opposed to native plants. I think they're wonderful, but I think that there are all these plants in urban areas that are so easy that you might as well learn to control them and manage them. And they certainly are not the most invasive, which I should have an error. I should have said that in that book because some of the most invasive plants are sold in, in nurseries and no one mentions that they are invasive. It's important to know that. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, getting the most from your small space food garden. Um, I brought some copies of the new edition of Golden Gate Gardening. Um, we have seven left, so we hope somebody's still interested in a few more. Um, if you have one of the green copies, I've made vast changes since that. Um, and if you and that changed the last chapter considerably, so the chapter 16 you should definitely read. It's called Eating from Your Garden. And it's important to do that. It's a different skill from growing the vegetables in the first place, learning to adapt them to your kitchen. And um, the, this edition is improved over the previous edition. The um, seed, seed catalogs, sources are all updated. Some have disappeared, some have been added. Some of the best ones have been added to small companies that are very good, and all the resources have been updated, and David here helped me update them. The plant names have been updated, which is important if we want to hold our head up in the plant world to have the proper Latin names. The whole Chenopodium group has disappeared. There's no Chenopodiaceae anymore. What's in that? Beet, chard, and a number of other plants, amaranth. There's an amaranthaceae, but there is no Chenopodiaceae anymore. Some of the weeds in that group. So that's important. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for coming to my talk. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to have a slideshow in a little bit, but first I wanted to introduce a couple of general subjects. And if you ever have trouble not hearing me, please say so. Back and you're having trouble hearing the words, tell me. Okay. Um, but I wanted to tell you before I even begin that I have that my events are always listed on my website, that you have to spell my name correctly <laughs> <laughs> to get my website. It's P E I R C E, and you can see that on the book. Um, and, but I'm sorry, Google knows, go, knows to find me anyway, but um, the website address is, and is specific and they have to know. That Pam Pierce is P E I R C E dot com. That's my website. And there's a link to my blog on my website. And if you go to my blog, you can find um, articles on gardening, photographs of pests, information on managing pests, uh, recipes, information on using the crops that you grow and other things. And you can subscribe now to my, to my blog. That's a new, new thing. And I always list public appearances on both the blog and the website and they are, they are in the, on the events pages. So you can find them located there. So Golden Gate Gardening includes four planting calendars and the, the third edition was the first to include four of them. The first two editions just had the two for the sunnier and cloudier or whoops, sunnier and foggier districts. That takes it away. Yeah, I'm gonna fix it for you. Okay, if I touch it, it can I you hear the feedback? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. But the third and fourth edition both have both all four, and the two that are then added. One is more or less. <laughs> more or less Walnut Creek, and the other one is more or less San Jose. <laughs> um, the book is basically Sunset 17, 16 and 17. Um, 14 
15 and 16 and 17 and um, zone 14 with some um, ex extrapolation. So people, up, I did, and in the new book I've made even, I had in the third edition um, changes to say, well, what if you're, what if you're in a really hot place? And I've done even more of that in the fourth edition to make sure that everyone understands that it'll work. But our climate is mostly Mediterranean. I, I talked to somebody the other day who said, oh, so you're being able to plant two weeks earlier in the spring because of global climate change. And I said, oh, these, I, I, I was taken aback. And I said, well, no, not really. Actually, I'm having a lot of trouble with mild winters, which are making, which are challenged to apples and roses and many things that require winter chill. And I'm having some trouble in the fall because I'm planting things to try to wait till the pests go in dormant, which they're supposed to do in mid-October, but it doesn't get cold enough by mid-October. Have you had that problem? Yeah, yeah. pests don't yeah. go in fast enough. And so it's a whole different thing. And, and, and then I realized that these people are learning their gardening from books written for the Northeast, where in fact they do have a two week earlier spring. But I wanted to tell them, yes, but, you know, yeah. people are dying in North Africa. <laughs> you know, I don't know. There are many things that are going on that in our, with our climate crisis that are outside of our garden and which are not nice for gardeners. Not to mention the fact that some of those gardens are going to be underwater by the time <laughs> they have more, more, by the time they can grow things and overwinter them better. Their garden will be underwater, so that, it's a minor point, but it is important. <laughs> so I don't know. I I I I tried. To, I'm very cautious about being impatient in general one to one, but I will tell you that it causes me to be impatient when someone says that because I think that there's a lot of things that are going on that we ought not to be so sanguine about. But I want to review for you the basic needs of all food crops, which are pretty much the basic needs of all plants except that we're growing things for food. And because we're doing that, we want them to grow big, we want them to grow fast, and if they grow bigger and faster, we have more to eat and it's more tender and mild. If it grows slowly, nah, it's gonna be small and it's gonna be not so succulent, not so, and so we want it to be fast. And we also want to put something else in as soon as it comes out, right? Because we want to have another crop coming after it. So we, we want to make those plants special, you know, really, really give them the best. It's kind of like growing annual flowers. Um, Dick Dunsmeyer gave a talk once called Annual Flowers, a short life and a merry one. <laughs> and that's pretty much what we have with vegetables, a short life, but a merry one, we hope. So we want to give them the best that they can get. Um, so you have a handout of the four core needs of vegetables to grow. And um, I, I urge you to refer to that now. And if you don't have that to get it, it should be available somewhere. Um, the first one is very good soil. And we can make very good soil out of just about anything um, in a couple of three years. No matter how clay it is, no matter how sandy it is, we can do it. And the way to do it is to add organic matter. Now, yeah, she has one there. Um, okay, so organic matter is our best addition, our organic amendment. We do not add topsoil. So Paul, no one's going to sell you topsoil. Topsoil has been percolating for quite a long time in the Middle West. It's the top, it has, it's, it's called topsoil, but it's also aged soil. It has lots of um, aged, aged organic matter in it. Nobody's gonna sell you that. They're gonna sell you um, bottom soil, basically. They're gonna sell you sand or clay. So that's not really what you want. They might add a little bit of fresh organic matter. You don't wanna buy topsoil, you don't wanna buy Planting mix, you don't want to buy potting mix, definitely. You want to buy some, a bag that's labeled amendment or make your own compost. And be aware that if your compost is made in a slapdash sort of manner without adding a lot of nitrogen to it so that it heats up, it probably doesn't 
have very much nitrogen in it, and it's not a high nitrogen fertilizer. So if you are using your own compost or, or, or use a red worm bin, which is kind of fun, it's like having a pet that you don't have to pay much attention to. Um, and you can even do it inside if you have a drip pan. People, there's a joke where someone's sitting on one and says, where's your, where's your worm bin when you're sitting on it? Oh, <laughs> you know, but I have a red worm bin. They're red worms. They, um, you know, you have to buy some. You can't start from your garden and they, um, they don't survive in garden soil. They really, they, another name for them is manure worms, which gives you a flu right away. But they live on, in my garden, a, a mix of newspaper shredded moisten and kitchen scraps and I don't give them all of my kitchen scraps some of them I freeze in a in a compostable bag and put out with the in the green bin but others I put out with the worms and they're very happy and they make a very high nitrogen um, compost you can buy worm castings but if you feel that you are not adding much nitrogen with your amendment you can also amend you can also fertilize that is you can add aged age manure, especially worm castings, fish meal, alfalfa meal, something that's or a, or a boxed uh, organic vegetable fertilizer, something that will up your nitrogen a little bit. So, and, and, and I would amend and add fertilizer twice a year if you are gardening year round, if you are raising vegetables year round. So that's the first requirement. Second is adequate water. Oh, and, and I wanted to say that plant food is a misnomer. Plants, what plants use for food, we know, is sunlight and water from the roots and um, carbon dioxide from the tops. But one of the hazards that we have from high temperatures is that, and I put that into this latest edition, one of the hazards we have from high temperatures is that all living cells, living cells also respire, which means that they also use oxygen. So um, when the temperature gets very high, it keeps on respiring, but the photosynthesis stops. So plants can kind of respire themselves to death when it's too hot. And that's what happened in Europe during the, they would have a heat wave several years ago, and it could happen again because um, there's a there's a there's a you can see the, the graph, you can see where photosynthesis levels off, stops, but respiration keeps on going. So plants then at that point are taking oxygen from the soil and putting carbon dioxide back in. So they're making the problem worse. So we do want to be careful. The second thing that they need is also oh, the, so the fertilizer is just, you know, it's, it's like our micronutrients. It's what it is. It's not really, they don't really eat it per se. They supplement their diet of carbohydrates, which they are able to create, from which they're able to create other materials. Um, with some minerals, which we can provide them. Um, so water, adequate water typically is one to two inches a week, which is why I encourage people to garden year round because the, the rains theoretically and hopefully will take care of our watering needs during the colder months. And it's good to have plants, the, the food plants in the ground at that, at that point. It's also good to eat what you grow, because otherwise you're wasting the water that you've used. If the, if the weather is particularly hot or particularly windy, they can take up to three to four inches a week. And water is measured as a observed or imagined layer on the surface of the soil. And it's better to walk, be, there'll be more about this during the, um, the slideshow. I'll show you some tools. Um, vegetables need enough light. Um, and for vegetables, if you are growing leafy or root crops, you need at least four hours of unshaded light a day. And when they say unshaded, they mean that the sun is not shaded by a structure or a plant or something. If it, um, so these figures assume that there will be days that are cloudy or rainy or foggy. And in fact, even San Francisco has a relatively high amount of sunshine compared to some of the Midwestern cities, which get that overcast that just comes in over the plains and stays there for, day, for weeks. So we do have a fair amount of sunshine. If you are growing 
um, fruiting crops like beans or tomatoes, anything that you're going to harvest something that forms after the flower, you need a minimum of six hours a day of unshaded light. And even in the winter, I'm able to grow, I'll show you pictures of some of the things I can grow in the winter in, in, um, in open shade, in house shades the garden. So the fourth thing that vegetables need is appropriate temperature. And we, can, we, we have broken the crops into two divisions. One is those which, which grow best at 55 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And most of these can tolerate a little bit of frost. And these are the things that we can grow in the winter. And in most locations in the Bay Area, we can also grow them in the summer. It's harder to grow them in the summer inland because it's too hot. But things like uh, broccoli, onion, lettuce, kale, peas, potatoes, carrot, etc., are our cool season crops. I would rather call them cool preferring crops because in San Francisco, when's the cool season? <laughs> I don't know. We have a cool season and a cold season. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes the cold season is during the cool season. <laughs> so um, warm season crops grow better, best between 65 and 95 degrees. And notice that top level. They do not, even tomatoes and beans do not do well when it's 100 degrees or 100 plus. And most of these are killed by frost, and these are the ones that even in the um, <laughs> even in the inland areas, or even yeah, wherever you're growing, you probably can only plant even in the shady in the foggy coastal areas. You probably can only grow them in the summer. The ones that have mild the mildest winters, you can probably only grow those in the summer. So. Um, Another of your handouts is a general calendar of planting that runs from July to July. Unlike those that you see most commonly that run from April to September, I'm trying to talk people out of thinking that the garden starts in April because that's when it starts, when the winter is cold, right? And yeah. I used to be garden center when I was garden central in, Indian, in um, San Francisco when I was starting the San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners. And People would call my number and I would get a ton of calls in April because everybody was starting a garden. And I keep wanting to say, no, 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 this is not when you start a garden here. So I did this one from July to July. Um, the temperature on any given day in the Bay Area is, is more similar 200 miles north or south than it is 10 miles inland. So you probably, you you pro you may have some of that cooling still, and you probably still have cool nights. I think the cool nights go all the way to to the um to the hills, and then you get on the other side of the hills. I go through the tunnel, and suddenly you you have warm nights, but you don't have here. And we have a long cool spring, which people in the Middle West would die for. I went to Indiana in April, and it snowed. So I thought, oh, well, I see. I forgot. So I went in May and it was 88 degrees. Oh no. I said, oh, I see. There's no there's no getting around it. It's going to be awful no matter what you do. So here though, it stays cool and the nights cool down and we are able to to live and the plants are, are happier. But as we know. In both summer and winter near the coast, we have a, a greater degree of, of difference. We have summers, we have summers that are cool, we have rare frost in the winters. In San Francisco, it's never outside of December and January. And in fact, the summers are too cool for some of the warm preferring crops. But we can grow many of those cool preferring crops all summer. But note that when you are near the coast and the, the summers and early falls are cool, you have to put some of your crops for fall in a little earlier because they're going to grow a little slower in the fall. So right near the right near the coast, I have to put my carrots in in, in July or August. You know, in my in my coal crops, I used to plant a lot of coal crops when I was gardening when I was teaching. I would have a hundred. 100 plants, starting with kohlrabi at one end and Brussels sprouts at the far end of a long bed. And we would plant them in early August before school started. And they would mature into the fall. And some of them would continue to mature into the early 
part of the second semester. Inland, the summers are hot, sometimes too hot for good growth, and frost is possible for several months of the year. I was just in Santa Rosa where they can have a frost as early as November 7th and as late as March 14th. So, uh, you know, it, it happened, February 14th, February 14th. Yeah, so they have a longer danger zone than we do. But I must say that a frost is different from a hard freeze. You know, in the Middle West, if, if it's gonna freeze, it freezes and then it, it stays frozen. They have what they call Indian summer, which is after a freeze. And it doesn't last very long. It's a weird name. And, um, but here, what we have, we don't have Indian summer here. I'm sorry, no matter what you think of the name, we don't have it. What we have is, we have some cold weather, then we have some warm weather, then we have some cold weather, then we have some warm weather. <laughs> I don't know, it's not the same thing. So we don't give up on our garden, the first frost. The frost is just that, that there's, that the air is cold, it's below 32 degrees. The um, freeze is when the ground freezes, and that's happened just exactly once in my backyard. It's the, the top part of the soil froze, but mostly what we have are, are frosts. And most of these winter crops can take a light frost, and I'll show you a picture that, that proves this. But if the summer is hot, we can plant the, and, and, the, and the fall is hot, we can plant some of these cool preferring crops, but we probably have to shade them a little from the, from the heat when we first put them in. And we can plant them a little later because they will grow faster because the um, temperatures are higher and they, they grow faster into the fall. But it's important to know that we should get them in early before the frost starts. One tip in my book that I'll share with you is to divide your, your garden and your garden, whatever you're, wherever you're planting your, your current, your vegetables, plant, divide it into four parts. And then you will plant one part in each of these four seasons and you will have a year round garden. Then you can fine tune it. You can decide what you want to grow more of or what you want to grow less of. So that's page 25 of Golden Gate Gardening as a chart. It's very, it's simplified, so there are more possibilities. Um, and you can find those in the vegetable chapter, which has more detailed information. But you can um, divide them into four. The first one is um, February, January, February, March. And I sometimes call that the secret season because it's the one that people don't know about. They don't, they don't think about it. They haven't, they haven't started to think about gardening yet because they're still, their heads are in the gardening books or the garden location, which is cold in the winter. Um, April, May, June is the one that everybody knows about. July, August, September um, is when you plant for the fall garden. And finally, October, November, December, which, in which there is not a whole lot to plant, but it, you know, there's a few important dates. When I tell gardeners about the July, August planting season, they usually say, oh, how can I plant anything in my garden in July and August? It's all full of summer crops. And I say, yeah, that's because you planted the whole garden up in, in April. And so it's full. So, But if you use the secret season, if you use that January, February, March, then those plants will be out in June. By the end of June, you will you can grow onions. You can have these big, beautiful bulb onions out by the end of June. And all of a sudden you've got all this room and it's sitting there. And in July, August, and September, you will be planting your, your fall garden. So you can do it. Um, so the final thing I wanted to tell you before we start the slideshow is about biennials. Those of us who live in mild winter areas need to understand biennials differently than does the average person who lives in a cold winter area or someone who's not gardening here. Many of us learned the definition of bi biennial in school. What did we learn? It grows, it lives two years, and then it dies, right? Anyone who's a gardener in the Midwest may know it, or in the East or somewhere where it's cold in the winter, may think of it as a flower that takes forever to bloom, <laughs> right? Because they plant their Canterbury bells in the spring and they don't bloom the first year, they bloom the second year. Oh no, I planned for them, they're not there. <sighs> but the gardener who's raising food in a mild winter area needs to understand biennials differently 
in a way that we don't see them in the Middle West because most of the vegetables are, many of vegetables are biennials and the ones that are, are mostly not hardy. And so they die in the fall and people don't see them flower, but we do. And so what is the corollary for that? If we are planting these crops to overwinter, we take two precautions. The first is that we want to plant them early enough that they have a chance to get big before cold weather stimulates them to bloom. So our definition of a biennial, which is much more useful, is that it's a plant that is stimulated to bloom only after a certain number of chilling hours in the winter. And then it blooms, and then it sets seeds, and then it dies. You see the difference? So if you plant it too late in the fall, and I always remember these two young ladies who had this beautiful little kale plant in their community garden bed. It was about this tall. It had just a few leaves, and it was setting up a flower stem in the middle in the spring. So about March is when you start looking. Although some plants, you know, they're a little... Fuzzy. Some, this year, this year March was so cold that it kept some things from from blooming until later. But it often is in March, and they had this tiny little kale plant that was setting up flower buds. And I said, "Yeah, well, when did you plant it?" They said, "November." And I said, "Well, this is it. <laughs> That's what you get." <laughs> and I never forgot the, the tears in this girl's eyes, and she said. You mean that's all? <laughs> yeah, that's all. You did it. <laughs> I don't know. That's all you get. So don't let that happen to you. And the other thing is that if you have planted them over to overwinter, don't let them sit. Or if you plant them in the early, like in January or February, don't let them sit there and 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 flower because they flower and then they form seed. There are two silver linings to that. One is that if you have flower buds forming on on collards, maybe on kale. I'm not as wild about the flower buds of kale, but collards, and, and if you cut the center of head out of a cabbage, you get shoots, side shoots that come up, and they're they're delicious. If you cut them before the flowers open, then they're still in bud, they're quite good. And I, I encourage you to do that. And the other is that um, the flowers of anything that's pollinated by insects will attack, attract beneficial insects to, to your garden. So I always let at least one leek and carrot or carrot or something bloom. There's a lot of plants and there's a there's a chart and tape on in one of your handouts that shows what pests are controlled by beneficial insects and how to attract them. And there's also a list in Golden Gate Gardening on page 108 that tells you what some of the flowers are that attract both beneficial insects and bees and maybe bees. It's important to know that maybe plants are not the only flowers that attract native bees. Who knew? And that one of the best things to have in, in your neighborhood to attract uh, honeybees are um, Algerian ivy and Himalaya blackberry. Oh. Well, you know, honeybees aren't native. They're from Europe and Africa. And so are the, the a lot of the weeds that we have. So they, they live on a lot of the Mediterranean weeds that we have accumulated in our Mediterranean climate. In any case, that's biennials, and you should be aware of them. Um, have a different a different way of thinking about biennials, and they are I don't know cabbage, carrot, um, all the coal most of the most of the coal family crops, except that they have bred some of the cabbage and broccoli to be annuals, so they don't need um, the broccoli doesn't need chill. Those are the little short season broccolis, and there are also overwintering ones. We'll look at some of the pictures. So I wanted to start by showing you some of the plants that I get the most from my small space with because I don't plant them. And I wanted you to be sure and know that most farmers don't differentiate between wild plants and things that they planted. Um, the, the, the jump between agriculture and hunting and gathering is not nearly as, as absolute as we think it is. That this is a wild onion, a wild Mediterranean onion. Um, it's called Allium triquetrum because it has a triangular uh, stem and a little ridge on the back of each leaf. 
it has a little stripe down each each petal, the tepal. And um, you should identify it before you eat it. It should smell strongly of onion. But if you see this growing anywhere and it's declining at this point, you'll probably not see much of it growing about now. It's it's harvestable between about December and April, and then it dies back and is dormant. So it's a good idea that if you see it to gather the um, bulbs, which are right near the surface, they're about a half inch in diameter. I don't think you can buy bulbs of this, or if you have it in your garden, um, collect the bulbs and put them in one place. Mine are enclosed in a um, concrete en encirclement. And if you find one somewhere else, eat it. <laughs> or um, move it when it's dormant so that you can have them controlled and in one place. I mean, a lot of your vegetables would come up wild if you let them, and this is just another one. So I grow this. And this is miner's lettuce, which you probably know. You can buy seed of it. It is also edible between December and April and dormant during the rest of the year. You may find plants still in a shady place that you can gather. And there's directions on my blog for saving seed. You put it on a large piece of newspaper because seeds jump a little when they pop out of the pods. And then you can plant them in October. And they use, it's growing, it's forming a little later than usual because the fall gets cold a little later than usual, I think. I used to bring this to a potluck in early December, and now it doesn't have to be late December to do that. But it's mild and succulent and tender and sweet, and the stems and the uh, flowers and the um, stems, stems of the flowers are all quite delicious. So I encourage you to, to have it in your garden, eat it if you, if you have it somewhere near. Oh dear, now what? Okay, got it. He got, he got it. He got it. Well, I got it. For some reason, it didn't want to do it, but now it's there. <laughs> this is New Zealand spinach, which is, I consider, uh, practically wild because it grows so wild in my garden. We just took out a whole bunch of it this last year, this last week. Um, it is native to, yep, New Zealand. <laughs> No one knows whether the New Zealanders, the natives, ate it because they were all dead before we could ask. <laughs> um, but it is quite edible. My neighbors use it, they steam it and use it as a regular spinach. And I have not, I, I had a friend who put the young leaves in salad, but I haven't been excited by it raw. But it loves both cool, cool weather and it will also do well in hot weather. So it's a really nice plant. And it is delicious in anything that calls for spinach, any quarantine recipe or uh, lasagna, vegetarian lasagna or soups. And I put some of these recipes on my blog and I will continue to do so as I as I learn about that. I had a, I have a friend who said that she freezes it and then crumbles it and uses it Spring with um, paneer, make oh. a stag paneer, an Indian dish from it. But I, I haven't tried freezing it and crumbling it and using it in other recipes that I know, so I'll put you know, I'll put it on my blog and let you know how it works. <clears throat> so um, I harvest the stem tips, two to four inches, not the hard seeds, and I um, use that. And you can buy seed or get seeds or seedlings from a friend. And there are updated seed sources in. I put some seed sources in my wheat chapter as well as in my vegetable chapter, but this is in the vegetables, even though it grows like a weed. And I count many edible flowers as unplanted crops. Let's see what happens. Ah, <clears throat> because I didn't plant them to eat, but there they are, and they're edible, and I use them. <laughs> so these are some of the common ones. Nasturtium. There's there's um, fava bean, which is edible and quite stylish in appearance and bean flavored. There are also many edible ornamental flowers, which you may know about. You can eat all roses if you haven't sprayed them with something toxic. And um, all fuchsias are edible. 
Their berries are edible, but they tend to drop when they're ripe and they're pretty insipid. Insipid? Insipid? Not very good. Um, I put in a dianthus, although I want to tell you to be sure not to eat something that you don't know was grown organically. Um, first few months after you bought it in the nursery because it could have pesticides on it. And forget me not, which I didn't know was edible, but it is. It's a member of the borash family, so you can eat the borash flowers and forget me not. This salad wow. is made from entirely weeds and edible flowers. Wow. Um, this is the one I used to bring to a potluck in early December, which people really liked, but I can't do it with the with the miner's lettuce anymore in early December. When it comes to the potluck, it looks like botany, and everybody admires it as botany, and then I put a balsamic vinaigrette on it and toss it, and it becomes food. So people get to watch the, the um, transformation, which is kind of exciting. <clears throat> You can decorate your salads any season, either with edible flowers or in the winter. Sometimes I use purple cabbage or the um, chopped up colorful stems of those were in the salad, in the large salad too, the chopped up stems of chard, colorful chard, which adds color. And there's the flowers of the wild onion down in the lower left. That's a winter salad, has some, it's made with real stems. And which is a lot trickier to grow than New Zealand, let me tell you. <laughs> but it can be done. And then there's a spring and a summer salad. The summer salad has dianthus, petals, and violas. I like violas better than pansies. Pansies are too big and you have to tear them up to, to make, to use them on the salad. They, oh, they, they're too big for the salad. So, now, I wanted to move into the fall and tell you that you can grow a lot of things in the, in the winter in shade. You're going to have more shade in the winter. The, the, the um, shadows will be longer. And here is parsley mixed with calendula. They're two different plants. They're growing in open shade in the winter, in December. And that's something that you can do in the winter. And arugula. And that little plant in the lower right is chervil. It has a flavor halfway between anise and um, celery, and the French really love that in egg. So, um, to grow a successful winter garden, the secret is to get most of the crops in before the weather turns cold. And here's a successful winter garden of our neighbors in a foggy neighborhood in San Francisco. <clears throat> so it, it can, it, you certainly can grow a lot of things over winter. Um, a lot of the crops are more hardy than we think they are. Here's kale. There were several nights of frost in San Francisco. This was in the demonstration garden at City College where the kale really looked terrible. So I was very distressed. But I went back a week later and took its picture, wow. and it popped back. I mean, they're gonna, we're going to lose the white leaves and some of the red leaves. Um, the green leaves are still are still perky, and it's going to grow back. It slowed it down a bit, but we will have a reasonable amount of kale before it, before it forms its flowers. So I was delight, delighted about that. Um, These are, these are peas. When I plant them in San Francisco, I choose November or February. The calendars will tell you to get them in a little earlier in cold winter climates, colder winter climates. And I prefer snap peas. These are the ones with fat edible pods. It means both the pod and the seed. It doesn't have that fibrous material between the seed and the pod, so you can eat the whole thing. I grow Cascadia, even though it says that it is a bush pea, I always use, I always give it a, a, a something to climb on. And there are some things to remember when you grow peas. One of them is be, be sure that it has both cross and uprights fairly close together. 
on your trellis because peas reach out with their tendrils and grab and don't grab either one. They're not like a bean that wants to twirl around something on the way up. So they need both. This one is, I think, grown on two by two by four inch um, wire, and it's called hog wire often. So, and even though it's a bush pea, it will grow two or three feet high, so you need to have something to hold it up. The second one is to um, is that you can wait a little longer to get something better than you can buy in the store with the snap pea because. Um, the ones they sell in the store are kind of flat to me. Mm -hmm. They need to get a little fatter. If they're a little bit fatter, the, the pea is the sweetest part. And you could, will quickly learn when you've waited too long because the pea becomes starchy. Mm -hmm. But you can wait quite a bit longer than the ones that they sell in the store. They have to you know, get over them and pick them all. You can't wait. But you can. And eat the whole thing. And the, the last thing is to cover them with rope cover when they're very small. And I, most of the things I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you pictures of, but I'm going to pass the rope cover because I want to be sure you know what it is. And for peas, I would, I would cut a piece. This is a good piece for a row of peas, a little wider than a foot, and about six inches longer than your row. And plant your peas in there, and then put it over the peas in kind of a, a bubble. And then make a little trench around outside the peas, tuck this into that and push the soil over it. And here is a picture. I've got a whole bed here because I get charred in it. But you don't have to do a whole bed. You can just do the row. But you want to make it high enough that the peas can grow three or four inches tall and then kind of push against it. But the water can go through and the sunlight can go through and it keeps it a little bit warmer. This one is a lightweight, soft one. They, they come a little bit heavier than this and they will be more protected against winter, but you don't really need that here. But this this is row cover. Um, it's kind of like the pellon that goes between two layers of the collar if you sew, but it's UV stabilized. You can take it out, dry it off, brush it off, and use it again the next year. Do you use anything to keep it up? No, that's the, it's called floating row cover. And the reason they say floating is that it floats above whatever is in there. So you just allow the the plants. only time that I would put something under it with sticks under it to hold it up off of the plant is if I was in a very windy patio and I was growing in a container or a roof. So I'll pass that. This one has been used, as you can see, it's got a little dirt on it. What do we have here? Oh, that's not where do you get it? Well, most nurseries carry it, and if they don't, sometimes they try to sell you something which is really classic with little holes poked in it. That's not it. Um, then Gardener's Supply is a good source, and it's gardener.com, or maybe gardeners.com. Gardeners.com. Anyway, they're very good, and they, they, will, they will sell you. And you can cut it up, so you cut a piece that's the right size for what you want. We used to take big, huge pieces of it and lay it out on the parking lot at City College and the class would cut up what they wanted and maybe by the piece that they took. But you can cut it with big pieces or small pieces. It doesn't matter in using. You can use it for one plant. And you can use it for whole beds. And you can use it for seeding rows. And seeding rows of peas, pea seedlings are edible. In, in Asia, and you may know about this because you may do it, but you can eat the pea leaves and they're delicious. They taste like peas. The reason I like to grow um, snap peas is that the um, harvest by weight per plant is greater than it is for any other kind of pea, although if you really want to grow snow peas, flat peas in your garden, because you cook with them, then that's fine. But, this, but I wouldn't grow the shell peas. I would buy a bag of frozen peas because you get an eighth of a pound of pea per plant and you have to throw away the pods unless you feel like peeling them, which is an arduous task and I would rather not. So that's why I grow snap peas. Baba bean is another plant. So peas, I'm, I'm putting those in there right then because November is a really good time to plant them. And, and But look at your calendar, be sure you know where you are. You may not know exactly where you are, in which case you may have to garden for a year or two to find out where you are, which is fine. But um, fava beans, generally, 
November is a good time to plant them. The um, the flowers, as I said, are edible. The young pods are edible. And um, I, I quite recommend that you roast the, the young pods before the beans have even formed. Roll them in a bit of olive oil, salt them, and roast them at 450 and check them in about 25 minutes. You want some browned areas, but you don't want burned ones. And um, you don't want charred pods, but you want brown browning to happen. But they're quite delicious and you know quite a wonderful order or vegetable. So um, but but the important thing to know about fava beans, you can grow them till they're mature, you can shell them, and then you have to double shell them, right? You have to take them out of the pods. So people think, well, that's a lot of work, but grow them and just eat the immature pods and you'll find that they're delicious. But also um, people want to use them as a, as a, um, a, a cover crop or green manure if you want to dig them into the ground and then wait a couple of months before they plant, which is fine, but you can't do both. You can't eat the beans and use it as a cover crop. And if you do both of those things, what you've done is you've eaten that extra nitrogen that the plant was going to put into the mm. soil. Mm. So you have to grow, cut them when they're about a foot tall and put them in your compost, chop them up, put them in your compost, or chop them up and dig them into your soil and wait a couple of months for them to compost if you want to use them that way. Um, once we get to the secret season, there is much to plant. In San Francisco and probably in many other places, you can grow um, by January and definitely by February, you can be planting um, a lot of things. And a really good small space, small space crop for this season is mesclun. Mesclun is several greens sold together Mix, the seeds are mixed together and you sow them together and you sow them thickly and then when they're about, oh, I don't know, five inches high, you cut, the, cut them to the first inch. And then you can do it again because they grow back. It drove a neat green crazy not to be able to separate them and plant them in rows. But <laughs> I told her, no, you're supposed to plant them so they're all jumbled up like that. Now I plant mine in a container in container mix and I do that because um, that way you don't accidentally cut a weed mm -hmm. with it and eat it. But this also serves as a good primer for many of the things that grow well in that time of year. You could, there are mixes that are all lettuce. There are mixes that are mixed um, mild lettuce and um, also spicy, spicy greens. And there are also openly spicy greens, and some of them are intended to be stir fried and others are intended to be eaten raw. So you can take your pick. This one has a lot of possibilities in it. That there in the front is a, um, a mustard, a small mustard called Mizuna, which is from Japan. And if you wanna grow it, any of these by themselves, that's fine. There's a red leaf mustard in there. There is um, katsoi up in the upper right hand corner, which is kind of soy choy, that is um, kap choy, kap soy, but it's a, a choy. In um, Chinese cooking, it's one of the best ones for winter growing and for avoiding snails. It's sometimes called a spoon green because it has long um, white stems and small green, dark green tips, leaf, leaf pads. And there's arugula and there's various kinds of lettuce and these are all possible to grow separately. Um, if you haven't tried arugula cooked, please do. It's very good in soup and it's good in, I, I have a recipe. I, it's either in, I, I think I wrote about it in Golden Gate Gardening, but you can also find it, I think on my web, but if you use it with um, with pasta or with um, ravioli and saute some onion and garlic and add some, some wine and cook that down for a while and then add some, Arugula, and it's very mild when it's cooked. It doesn't have any arugula flavor. So if you hate arugula, you will not notice it, that it's arugula if you do that. And since it's so productive, it's a really good thing to know about using it that way. And then add your Parmesan, I mean, your um, ravioli has been cooked, add a little Parmesan. It's, it's really good that way. Add some 
feta, take some feta and mash it in a flat bottom bowl with water so that it makes kind of a tasty, creamy um, sauce and pour that over it. And oh boy, that's good. <laughs> you shouldn't be hungry, you just ate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. So um, I put some radishes in here. Somebody said here that they grew them here in the summer. I usually plant mine in the fall and into the spring. Um, you can also plant the large radishes in the fall or the late summer. When I say fall, I mean late summer, really, for the most part, because fall starts September 21st, and most of these things you would like to have in the ground before then. But the small radishes are fine. They have a very low um, temperature of germination, so you can plant them in the secret season. And it's a good thing because after the end of March, often the root maggots, if you have root maggots, they come out at the end of March and they will eat their way into the radish, which is very unappetizing. <laughs> it's a different one for carrots. Let's we'll talk about those if you want to, <laughs> if you have them. And a winter, a winter lettuce mix. This was a um, mix that I separated and grew in, in the windowsill and transplanted. The best um, oh, carrot, the best red, oh, I can't talk. The best lettuce is, um, are, there are lettuces for growing in cold climates. And then there's one that do best in the summer. So you look, and look at the description and if it says, Bolt resistant, that's one you should plant in the warmer part of the year. And if it says cold hardy, that's one you should plant in the cooler part of the year. Broccoli, choose the ones that are called sprouters, meaning that they make side heads. I've been able to keep them going for up to a year and a half mm -hmm. just by cutting the side heads. Now, sure, they're small, but what do you do when you have a big chunk of broccoli? You cut it up, right? So, okay. <laughs> and also grow early cabbage that time of year. This is an early cauliflower. This is so brown. Very good early variety. Plant all kinds of greens in that secret season. All kinds of root crops. And you can plant them in the secret season or you can plant them in the summer or you can plant them to mature in the fall if you um, if you choose to do so in a pool where it's relatively cool. Also, leeks, lettuce, see your handout. Mm -hmm. um, do not plant, plant Brussels sprouts in the secret season. Do not plant them in the spring, the April, May, June either. Plant them after the longest day of the year. They will mature into the fall. They are an unreformed fall crop. They are, they expect the weather to turn cooler. While the, and the days to get shorter while they're developing. And if you plant them, even if you find them in the nursery, don't buy them in the spring. Try to educate those, those people, my goodness. They'll <laughs> tell you anything that you ask for, although they have been reading my book and they've been or offering some of the varieties that I that I suggest, but, but they'll, they'll tell you watermelon seeds and slope by the ocean <laughs> if you want them. Maybe you're sending them someplace where it's hot. They don't know. <laughs> but if you buy, if you grow uh, Brussels sprouts in the spring, they will open up and the, the aphids will get in and you will have a mess on your hands. So start their, start their seeds in June indoors or buy them and plant them in July, August. Count back, 100, count, count back the number of days to maturity. And incidentally, you should know that the days to maturity for all cold crops and for cabbage and, and, I mean, and for tomatoes and Eggplant and peppers is all after they've been growing to become a seedling for five to seven weeks. So days of maturity for those crops and those crops only is after you have grown the seedling. So you can plant a lot of these crops going into the fall but here is some carrot that was grown as it went into deep shade. So the ones on the left were had adequate sun and the ones on the right did not. And when I pulled them up, what happened was that the lower part of the root stayed white and narrow. So I learned, mm. don't plant them that late, be careful. Um, this, this is um, a charred plant that was planted um, 
in the fall, in the late, late summer, in the fall, and it is bolting, which it will do in March. My, my chart is bolting now, it was late. Mm -hmm. There's one plant that just didn't bolt last year and it didn't bolt again this year, I don't know. And it's the same seed packet, so who knows. But uh, most of them will make these um, central stems that come up. This one's kind of attractive, but it won't be when it, when it blooms, I can assure you. And I don't grow beets and chard to attract beneficial creatures, even though they are biennials and they do bloom in the spring, but they are wind pollinated and they, the, the bees and the beneficial <coughs> the flies and the creatures that eat insects will not come to them. Hmm. There's, there's the cabbage, which is in bud in the spring. Um, and there's a cabbage plant flowering. Has anyone watched the cabbage plant flower before? No. Yeah. The one that's in the, um, the yellow? Oh, but don't wait that long. Because they're not, they grow about this tall. If you read a botany book, it'll tell you how tall all of these plants get. And so carrots grow four, four feet tall, five feet tall. And you say, what? But they do when they're blooming, they will bloom that they will grow that tall. So this is this is ones that were either put in too late and people were still waiting for them to get big and they didn't get big, they flowered. The yellow way. flower? What? With the yellow flower? Yeah, with the yellow flowers. Mm -hmm. There's carrot flower heads. I often see surface flies mm -hmm. and other beneficial creatures hovering about them. You don't want all your carrots to bloom, but it's okay to have a carrot that's blooming here and there. So now we, we're going to, um, there's a garlic harvest. You plant that when either in October or in February. Um, but be aware that seed companies sell, that companies that sell garlic sets often sell out. So you want to look for them, start looking for them in October and try to get them as soon as you can. It's best to buy them from a nursery because they should be certified disease-free. And you don't want to plant a grocery store, even an organic grocery store garlic, because chances are you'll spread a garlic disease in your garden, and you don't want to do that. Same goes for potatoes. Try to try to buy them your sets from someplace that doesn't have diseases. So you separate the cloves, and you put them in the ground, bottom down, pointy pointy end up. You don't water them until they are up. You start with moist soil, of course. And then you um, don't water till they're up, and you harvest them in late June. So planting them in February, you would get a little bit less garlic because they really they really like to get a start over the cold winter. But you can do that. And this is what we all want. And I did grow these in San Francisco one year. Recently, I've had late blight. If any, there's pictures on my blog if anyone's curious what that looks like. <laughs> but I grew all these in, in San Francisco in the warmer part of the city. But this is more likely what you will see if you try to grow tomatoes in the coolest part of the city. Does anyone live in San Francisco then? You probably can grow them here, but if the nights are colder than 55 degrees, which can happen on any night in San Francisco, chances are the, the tomato doesn't get fertilized, it gets pollinated. That is, the pollen grain lands on the top of the stigma, but it has, I'm, I'm pointing at I'm making this long distance, but actually it's a tiny little distance, but it has, the, the nucleus has to divide in two, and one nucleus is the tube nucleus, and it grows down into the ovary. And the other one is the germination, the germ, germinative nucleus, and it's the one that's gonna fertilize the flower, and it doesn't make it, uh -huh. because the tube doesn't get long enough. So the flower falls off and you don't get tomatoes. So I recommend in the city people grow, I would probably say it's better here too, is to grow taller plants that have many flowers because should the night happen to be cold, you've got flowers. Whereas a lot of these short plants that are grown, they're, they're developed for cold winter areas. They're very short. And they bloom, they're determinate is the word. In, indeterminate is tall and determinate is short. So the term determinate plants that bloom when they're short, but they all bloom at the same time. And the um, commercial growers love them because they can send the tomato picker through the, the machine 
nowadays and pick all of the tomatoes at once. Whereas the tall ones, they have to hire someone to go in and pick them and then pick some more and then pick some more. But for the home gardener, we like the tall ones better because we like the flowers to be blooming and the flower fruit to be forming many times so that there might be warm nights when you get lots of tomatoes setting, whereas on the colder nights, you might not. So I say grow a tall one and the smaller fruited ones are more likely to have more flowers. This one is called Juliet. It has some late flight resistance and many flowers and many fruits. And it's quite a, a rampant plant. So I also recommend that you try, um, to, to, if you're having, does anyone have trouble with late flight? Do you know what that is? Even it's, 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 it's declining slightly, but your, um, the tops of your, your fruit is kind of a greedy brown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have um, brown areas. I'm gonna, there's a there's a um, anti fungus spray that I'll tell you about after the talk that helps that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm looking for not for resistant varieties. The one I found best for large food crop is called damsel, and um, it's a it's a good one to try. And also I grow um, Juliet, and there are some others that are pretty good for that. So, um, oh, so zucchini for planting in, in um, spring, it really takes off after the longest day of the year. This one is a, a Romanesco type, which I like because it has fairly large babies. I like to pick my zucchini when it's tiny. And when this one is first, first fertilized, it's a, 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 a to this long, it's eight inches long, it's just tiny, but it's fertilized. And I, I prefer it over one that has these little short fruits when they're first fertilized because I like the baby ones. And I like the baby ones to be big. <laughs> <laughs> and here we have climbing beans, which I like to grow. Scarlet runner, royal burgundy, the purple one. And gold marie, which is a, a Romano bean, more commonly, more commonly find the, um, the uh, big ones. January King is an overwintering cabbage. It's one of these unreformed cold crops that's best planted in late summer because it um, you can't really plant it in in um, the secret season because it wants to overwinter and form these, these beautiful, beautiful heads. And the only really good reason to grow cabbage is that it's so pretty in a garden. Yeah, yeah. it is. That's true. They cut off all the pretty parts when they sell it to you. This is this is a, a winter growing. Um, Broccoli, purple broccoli. Yeah, I had a friend who was a teacher and she really loved this plant because she said every kid could take one ahead. Oh. But this one is one that you plant in late summer and it's from Northern Italy. And this is an unreformed, unbred, rebred um, broccoli. The ones that you find mostly do not need the winter chill to make heads. And that's because they were bred for the American prairie where we don't have any need for them. They would die in the winter. Whereas these are from Northern Europe, I mean, excuse me, Northern Italy, where they get a temperature similar to ours and they overwinter. It comes in in, in um, it, it comes in, in in February, March, April. Mm -hmm. So the last part of the talk here is about um, water. And gardening year round has to be mentioned as part of that subject because it allows you to use the winter. Rain and in fact, in fact, water the, the soil can be too wet in the winter. And I, when I was teaching, this would sometimes happen, and I was able to tarp during the rains, and then remove the tarp to let it dry between rains. And this worked extremely well. Um, I put a bucket upside down in the middle. I put rocks and bricks around the edge. When it stopped raining, I took it off. I mean, I only had Saturdays, so I had to have something. <laughs> And the way to tell if the soil is the right moisture is to, when you, if you have clay, this is more critical, is to, to brush off the surface, dig up a little bit of it, put it in your hand, squeeze it tight, open your hand, take the other hand and tap it. And if it breaks up, it's the right moisture to dig. If it's too dry, if it's just powdery, that's you know, hard like a rock, then you know, yes, that's too dry. You should water it really thoroughly and, and either tarp it or just go away for a while, a few days come back. 
but if it's too wet, it will clump up and if you put your thumb in it, it'll come out like a thumb, thumb pop, right? Clay, that's not what you want. So you want it to crumble. If you dig soil that's too dry or too wet, especially clay soil, it will compact and it will um, drive out the oxygen and the plant roots won't have enough oxygen. I use a sprinkler, which makes a gentle shower, especially when I've just transplanted some seedlings or sown some seeds. Do not use one of those handheld hoses that you squeeze and it makes a spray. Often the spray is too hard, mm -hmm. damages the plants. And also you get bored standing there holding it. <laughs> so this this just sort of sits there and it, it takes care of the job. Because you want it to really, you want to soak it for a long time. If you water just a little bit, you water just the surface. Mm -hmm. And if you water just a little bit every day, you may soak down, but probably the surface stays the moistest. And if that happens, the roots come up to the top and then the yeah. plant is not drought tolerant. So you want to water, I water once a week, except if it's really hot and windy, sometimes I'll do it a little bit more often than that. Here are three tools. One is a moisture meter, which you can drive into the soil to see how deep, how deep your watering has gone or how deep the drying has gone. It should be a foot, an inch or so down before you water again. Um, there's the sprinkler there. I like a, a rectangular pattern for that. And there is a um, timer, right, which you put at the back end of the hose and you can turn it on and that helps you because you, it turns off the water. And you haven't remembered to turn it off, but it's turned itself off. And of course, you can use a drip irrigation system, but you have to be careful not to let that lull you into thinking you don't have to garden because you still do have to pull weeds and pay attention to your batteries. And one 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 of the interest, most interesting jobs I had was looking up the manual online and finding out how to replace a battery for someone. <laughs> my plants are dying. My plants are dying. Yes, right. Well, <laughs> you can't you can't replace gardening with a with a drip system, but you can use it. This one goes into a bed, and I know someone who who, who rigged a, a sprinkler system in the bed for seedlings as well as having the drip system. But uh, my my advice is don't do that because you get out there and look more often than you actually get out there and sprinkle. Well, there's another picture right there, but I can't get to it. There we go. Um, this is a new spun stainless steel gopher that's a, um, a rat cage. I've heard that sometimes they can be through them, but usually not. And it's a lot easier to handle than the ones that have that are tough and hard and you have to open them up. And this one is soft and I get one that's bigger than the root ball so that I have extra space for the roots, dig a big hole, line it with that. And, um, and then you can unroll it up over the plant and fasten it at the top for a while if you want want to do that. Mm -hmm. And here's some gopher wire that's installed under a raised bed. Incidentally, I'm not spending much time on pests. This this talk, I can give a talk on pests, but I'm, there's some on my blog. And if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them after a talk. This is a bed that was built to eliminate all kinds of pests, specifically when people have um, climbing rats. Group rats, and they are big pests. I have, in fact, burrowing rats. So the underground part is best for my garden, but the top rats are harder to manage. But they built this gardener supply, incidentally. Um, this is, is an online company that has quite a, and they'll send you an endless catalog if you log on, but they have a, um, um, a lot of different covers that you can put over a couple of plants or or a, a whole garden and walk into it or whatever you want. And if you're having if you're having trouble with mammal pests, I'm not a mammalian pest specialist, but we can get a book from the um, ag ag agricultural resources publications that tells you how to track them. And you and they are the problem with them is that they're they're a community pest and we really don't have laws that help deal with it. I was realizing the other day that we have laws that help us to um, prosecute 
a, a store or a restaurant or a person who has attracting who's attracting rats, but we don't have legislation that helps us cooperate as a neighborhood to deal with rats. We don't have it. We should have because they can be a big problem, such as and then also squirrels. Yeah. One of the things we found is catching rats and mice the best way is choosing chips or choosing crackers. To attract them. They love Doritos. Cheese Doritos. So, so are they out there? It's better than peanut butter with the <laughs> with the All right, but they steal that bait, and you know, if you want to trap a rat, you have to put the bait out. You have to put the trap out unbaited, and let the and the stuff lying around it. And then, in about three nights, you can bait the trap, and they will steal it. And so, I, the most recent thing I've read is pop glue with um, something, and glue something to it, so that they can't get it off so easily. Yeah. Um, we were also told that any traps or anything you can use, don't touch it with your hands, use gloves. But I've done that. They smell the peanut on it. And yeah. Avoid it. I have so, heard that, and I did it. I touched it with my hands, and I had I caught seven rats okay. last, last year. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yes, it's, it's possible. I also caught a couple of birds, and then I stopped trapping for a while. Because I said, okay, use them. And I've heard that if you take uh, a Tupperware and cut a hole in it and put in it half half jiffy cornmeal muffin mix and half baking soda, that will kill them. But then someone said, well, that's inhumane because they can't deal with the baking soda in their digestive system and it will kill them. And I said, well, they're not humans. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but I'm tempted because it's, it's I really have to, I really have to stop them because they eat the roots of my parsley and yeah. my carrots they destroyed my carrot crop last year and the wild onions and yeah they're a terrible thing yes mm. i don't know if you know mm. uh, we had a yeah i don't know about the sound system and, and so we plug that in mm -hmm. and they, they that I don't know. I don't know about the sound frequencies, well, whether they yeah. actually will be. <laughs> so that was too late. Yeah. Okay. But you can see this is um, closed in and then it can, it can be raised. And I've seen other designs. And um, the final thing I wanted to say briefly was about containers. This is... Um, Fiberglass window screening, which you can buy at a hardware store, oh, by yeah. it's about this wide, and you can buy a couple of feet, a foot of it, or a couple of feet of it, or whatever. And you can put that underneath your pots at the bottom. You have a handout on growing in containers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to be sure that you know that this is a better solution than putting pot shards or pebbles in the bottom of your container because doing that actually raises the soil level and impedes draining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is better. I use coffee filters. Coffee yeah, filters yeah. might be okay. Yeah, coffee filters. But they would rot. Yeah. If they're paper, they would rot. This will not rot. And you can take it out and reuse it the following year. Yeah. Um, plants yeah. that are in containers um, are have a challenged root system. The final little short series here is of plants growing in containers yeah. that are edible. They have um they're quite challenged and you you can grow delicious and wonderful vegetables in containers but they need lots of plenty of enough fertilizer you have to be sure that your soil is fertile enough you have to replace or at least half replace your potting mix every year you need to um, make sure that they don't get too dry yeah very important and this is and you have to use choose a big enough container so you can use these little containers these are lettuces growing in, sh in shallow containers in February and here is char in a 12 inch pot so you have um, some of this on your handout and there's a page about it you go and get gardening choose your container to make sure it's deep enough and big enough to grow the plant that you're planning to grow this is african blue basil oh yeah in your climate it should grow four feet tall i went through every week and cut spent flowers which is a task the beneficial creatures love this plant. They love the flowers, all kinds of them. And finally, squash or large tomatoes should be in a half barrel yeah. or something that size mm -hmm. because they really need lots of root space. Mm -hmm. So 
to wrap it up, and it's kind of hard to see that, isn't it? But it's um, hope we should go like the flowers and bird song and sunshine in your gardens and happy garden to you. Yes, I have a question. That's it. Let me let me let me finish. I'm just going to say happy gardening to everybody. <laughs> 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 Coffee grounds is that good for what? Coffee grounds. Coffee grounds is good for a garden, but scatter them around. They make the soil a little acidic. They have a good balance of nitrogen and, and other other nutrients. But don't don't put them in all of one place. Somebody I somebody I talked to said, "Oh, I'm putting them all here." I said, "No, put them everywhere." <laughs> so so yeah. the your, the roll cover. What size of the plants when you take the row cover off? When it pushes against the row cover, take it off. Yeah. Is that how big should the plant get? Yes. The, the big problem I have with peas and beans is the squirrels dig them up and eat the seeds. It's, oh, you know. well, you may have to have a higher protection. Row cover may have to be that. You may need some protection in the larger plant to what they offer in at the school board, one of the great events is completely dominated, not that kind of onion that we had there, but a different kind of wild onion. And I don't know how to get it out of the... How to Are you talking about an onion that has an onion scent, or it looks like an onion? Have you smelled it? Pardon? Have you smelled it? Well, I've eaten some of the greens and they taste okay. It tastes like an onion. Yeah, but it's 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 not that variety. It has more of a radiating um head of flower. You might have garlic chives. Maybe that's it. It's bloomed in it bloomed in um if it's flat head flowers, it's white that bloom in July. Well, they're they've been blooming now, early spring and summer. I don't know what you have. If it tastes like an onion and smells like an onion, it's probably an onion. But you really have to dig out all the bolts in order for it to spread it and cut off the flowers before they set seed. Yeah, I've been trying to do that. Luckily, the flowers are really pretty of all the houses. Yeah, well, good luck to you. There's something that looks like that looks kind of onion but it is not. It doesn't smell like onion. It's called devil bowl. People call it false garlic, which I think is yes, too bad because there isn't that thing in there. But it's uh, Melba's cardamom, Brazil, terrible stuff. It has, that one has uh, that deep. I mean, as deep as it'll shovel. So, but the, um, the allium triplectrum has bolts right at the surface. I don't know. You're going to have to dig down and find out where the bolts are. You're going to have to find out when it's dormant. You're going to have to find out how deep you have to get them out and take off the flowers too. But hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and. Have a happy 